Before we get started tonight, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, Ms. Isla Privet, a uh, longtime member of Willis Privet's wife, has passed away, and I think we owe it to him to give a moment of special concern to her. And let's, for that, let's just have a moment of silent prayer, please. Councilman Pruitt was with us for 30, 30 years, I believe it was, and uh, him and Miss Idle went to just about all the meetings that we had and, uh, with the league and different organizations and all, and they were always a, a fine contribution to what we did and all. And we, we certainly keep them in our thoughts and our prayers. Has uh, anybody served longer than Willis? What was the question? Has anybody ever served longer than Willis? I believe was the Bufflap up there. I believe he served for 30 years, did he not? I mean, I just, you know, it is, I, I just, you know, he was just such an important, he is he was. such an important man in this community yeah. and all yeah. the stuff he's yeah. done. And yes, sir. I agree. All right, well, first we'll uh, go through with our special meeting, uh, and that's on a bid award on the Cypress Drive pump station, and I'll call on Anne Marie if she will to go over that with us. Well, thank you, Mayor. So, I wrote to you in the agenda review memo that originally um, we were hoping that this project could be added to the existing contract that we have with Central Builders, the company that is in town finishing up the um, I, I sewer work. But the State Department of Environmental Quality, they're our, a partner to this project because they have provided the um, zero interest loan that's funding the work. They want the project to close out and of course a, um, and a change order would extend the project another couple months. So they asked if the town would solicit bids and um, handle that, pro that project as a separate contract, which we did. Um, Wooten Company assisted us with soliciting bids um, we sent out bids to three contractors and received one bid from Central Builders. Um, and so we're asking tonight for you to consider awarding that bid. Um, Golden Leaf is a partner also, and they are funding um, $47,000 of the um, cost of the pump station. When we started this project way back when, after Hurricane Matthew, Wooten Company estimated that's what the cost of the pump station would be. But once it got into design, um, the cost went up dramatically. And then, of course, we all know that with COVID, um, pricing has increased a lot on um, mechanical equipment. So the bid that Central, bid, Central Builders has submitted is $111,111. $111. And we're asking that you consider um, awarding that bid tonight. And then the next action item would be the budget amendment. And I can go over that after you decide whether or not you're going to award the bid. OK. All right. Any questions about what Anne-Marie just told us? Were they the only uh, bidder? Yes, that we did not receive other bids. Okay. And it kind of makes sense, because they're already here, and they know us. And um, Right. Hey, and is that the uh, implementation of the uh, pump station? Does that impact any neighbors on in that area? Corey, they won't notice any change. The, what's going to happen is it will enable the town to abandon two or three manholes that are now taking in a lot of um, creek water. Yeah, and so it will it will be a real benefit to the town that will be reducing the amount of inflow and infiltration into our sanitary sewer system. But the customers, they won't um, realize a difference. Has yeah. Central Builders done a lot of work for us in the past? I think this is the first contract. Yeah, the, first, right? the first project, but they're out of they've been um, 
they've, overall, they've been very good to deal with. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? If not, I will uh, accept a, a motion to proceed with this. Make a motion. Have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or questions? If not, all those in favor of the uh, motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And Ray, if you will uh, talk to us a little bit about the budget amendment. I will. And um, thanks to Virginia, um, she was able to prepare a budget amendment for you to consider um, utilizing funding from our existing water and sewer fund. And really, thanks to Corey. I mean, Virginia can make the numbers work, but Corey, um, and I had written to you recently that um, a big project that we had budgeted for in the Water and Sewer Fund pertaining to the main sewer lift station right out here, Corey found an engineering solution that um, is ended up is going to save us a lot of money. We're not going to have to spend nearly as much money as we anticipated. So thank you, Corey. And with that, we're able to divert the funding that we need for the uh, Cypress Dive pump station, transfer from the Water and Sewer Fund to the um, I&I &I Capital Project Fund. Okay, we need a, a motion. Any, any questions or anything of Anthony or Corey on the uh, budget amendment? Got a question just on budget amendments in general and the water and sewer fund in general. The water and sewer fund is generated from revenues from our water and sewer, is that correct? And is it like a pass-through account, like our personal checking account where money goes in and then money goes out? Or is it more like a savings account uh, if you compare it to like personal finance? We try to have a savings account in all of our funds. Okay. So at the end, and you'll see when we get the audit from June 30, hopefully um, you'll see that we have added funds. And that was my question, where reserve. where yes. does that stand as opposed to where we like it to be? So we've added funds. Well, I'm hoping we will add. I have, okay. We're waiting for the audit to I be see. delivered. But okay. we always um, hope to be able to add revenue um, at okay. the end of the year. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, I will have a motion to approve the budget amendment. Mm -hmm. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, now we will move into our committee meetings. And the first on the agenda is the Public Works Committee, and that's uh, chaired by Councilman Miller. Thank you, Mayor. We have uh, two items of business tonight. Uh, one being re uh, review phase one, water treatment plant renovations and upgrades. And number two, review phase two, rehabilitation of wells and construction, new groundwater storage tank. Uh, Mayor, both these items of business do not require any action by Council at this time. Uh, Mayor, our public <coughs> works director, uh, Corey Wood, is with us this evening to give us an update on how well both treatment plants one of Beaver Hill and Freemason are currently operating and share with us some trihalomethane sampling results. In addition to this, uh, Corey will give us an overview of the phase two rehabilitation of wells and construction of the new groundwater storage tank. As you may recall, uh, in 2018, uh, the town received about $1.3 million in funding from the state to uh, implement phase two project. This time I'd like to call on Corey who's going to give us a review of these two items. All right, well good evening Mayor and Council and my name is Andy. Um, like Councilman Miller said, we're going to uh, try to take a look back and recap at the um, <clears throat> pretty major milestones that the town completed as far as this water treatment um, facility improvements. Um, really starting with phase one and once we finish up with this presentation will end kind of where we'll begin with phase two. Um, so it's hard to believe, but yeah. now we started this project back in um, February of 2019 uh, after all the funding 
and everything um, had, had came in. Um, we uh, proceeded to notice the award to construct um, February 5th of two, uh, 2019. Um, the contracts were executed March 11th and then the notice to proceed was um, very shortly after on uh, March 15th of 2019. Um, since that time we have had um, a couple of council updates. Um, this is really kind of the, the, the first phase of, of what we've done to make improvements. And during the, the um, as we kind of hit major milestones at each facility, or particularly at one facility, um, we did try to provide you guys an update. And it's hard to believe it's been over a year now um, since those updates um, were shown. And I, and I do think we also had one in late September, maybe early October of 19 that I forgot to improve, uh, add to this. As far as our progress meetings, um, once the project started, you see there's a little bit of lag time between the notice to proceed and the actual council updates. The majority of this was because of lead times on equipment. Um, so once really, once we really got going, um, we did try to meet monthly up until the point that we had our Beaver Hill startup in November. Um, shortly after that, um, the crews began to work on the Freemason facility and then we had our initial startup there in April of 2020. Um, we did close this project out um, just this past year, December, um, and that's really when we um, received our engineering certification from our project coordinators from Stroud and Sun, and uh, we completed our final walkthroughs of both facilities. Um, so kind of looking back, some of these photos are familiar, they're from previous previous presentations that we've had, but as you can see, um, it's a pretty major transformation. This is, this is really after things um, began to be demoed on site, um, materials began to, to uh, come in and be staged. Um, as you can see, this is in June, and we, we had a second update in August, kind of where the exterior structure had been added to and some improvements had been made really around the foundation and some of the just kind of exterior features. It's really when we would have gotten in our media um, and we really got power to the facility. That was really kind of a big step for those contractors to get in and really start some of the big electrical work. Uh, and then on our third update, if you look, you know, things are starting to kind of clean up on the outside relative to what we saw, you know, three months prior to that. Uh, some of the interior start to take shape. Um, if you look out at the bottom, left corner we have a breezeway which is potential for uh, future additions as well as some of the electrical controls um, were being installed and this is really where we began to fine tune things inside which you'll see you know three months prior to that you know significant change foundations um, was removed additional supports and rebar and concrete were added and then within two months vessels were set and plumbing had began um, if you look at the difference between August of 2019 and our September of 2019, you can see that most of the plumbing had been completed. Um, and if you notice that some of the vessels are actually opened, and that's where the guys are actually installing media. We're getting close to really trying to test things, check for leaks, make sure we don't have any problems, see how the electronic controls function, um, how they communicate um, with some of the mechanical devices that help this process run. Um, you know, just in, again, in 30 days, you can see the significant difference in just how open the structure felt inside on the top image back in August of 19 versus um, where we were just, just over a month later in September of 2019. Um, you can see an addition being added to separate the high service pumps from the water plant um, itself. Um, that was really a safety concern as well as just some kind of operational kind of housekeeping keep things as, as isolated as you can so you have you know less things that could go wrong if something does go wrong it's always nice to keep you know water away from anything electrical so there was some method to the madness there for, for separating that um, but if you look at some of the final final photos um, we started this plant up in November 2019. 
Um, you can see some of the exterior improvements that were made. This is at our Beaver Hill facility where the wild water tank um, aerator as well as the tank itself received some plumbing improvements as well as the, the tank itself was lined um, and really rehabbed as well as the aeration unit here did receive some electrical upgrades. This is kind of where the process starts once, once things leave the well. And so I've tried to put these in that order so you would kind of see as things step through the uh, Beaver Hill facility. So once the, the water leaves, the raw water tank, the high service pumps really do two things. They pull from that tank as well as supply pressure in order for the vessels to operate, whether that's a backwash or whether that's just normal operating cycle. Um, once the um, drinking water passes through a, our cleaning process, I'm not sure what that is. Um, it's then chlorinated and then from here as you can see James from the day that we decided to open the valve and received all the um, approval from the state as well as engineering certification. This is where it leaves the plant. And so um, you can tell he was happy for two reasons. He had a brand new plant to, to learn from and to help troubleshoot, but he also um, had received his sea well certification, which was a, was a huge accomplishment for a relatively new hire employee over the period of three years. Um, something maybe um, and here are some final photos of our Freemason water treatment plant um, there's a little less to look at here just the nature of the facility itself um, the footprint of the plant is much smaller um, than what we have at Beaver Hill so there's there's not a whole lot to see but just like before um, well water comes into our raw water tank our high service pumps supply that water from the raw tank through the process, which this is kind of flipped. Freemasons is aligned just a little bit differently than that's chlorinated and sent out to the distribution system. Um, you know, when you look at what we did at Beaver Hill and what we had at Freemason, I mean, the process was relatively the same, just in a much smaller window. This plant actually came online in April of 2020. Um, because majority of the materials and equipment had already been staged in that first two month lag that we had back in March of 2019. So what does all that mean? What's the, what's the long and short of this? Um, what, is, what is really the objective of the town and, and, and what did we learn? Well, what we learned is, is, is that we do have a way of managing our former TTHM problem. Um, if you look back at the two sample sites um, between April and July of 2020, once both plants were relatively close to being online entirely and self-sufficient, um, you can see you know we're really close between our North Broad Street sampling site as well as our, our West Water Street. We, we typically do see that number lower just because of the um, commercial use versus uh, more of a um, residential or vacant area. So, you know, you do have some attention time there that's a little bit longer than what we see on Water Street. But, you know, once, once we kind of got our, our feet wet and learned how to operate both plants and balance those out, um, things begin to, to level off um, at both sites. And then really, um, in October, once we got um, the contractors out of here, um, we were really at the point of only calling those guys in if there was some type of repair that was needed, something had malfunctioned. Um, we were really kind of standing on our own two feet at this point. Um, and as you can see, um, the two um, employees, uh, Roy Aylons and, and James Murray, did a wonderful job really learning that, figuring out how to fine tune this thing. Um, and you can see that it's also confirmed in our January. Uh, 2021 samples where things are starting to trend down as a whole. Yes. One question. Will the community know this? Is there a way where we can, need to commu we can communicate this to the community about the improvements made on the Tri-Hill methane? I mean, what a job. I mean, that's fantastic. Is there, 
I mean, I know we, we used to send out the letter with the electric bill saying, you know, we're not in compliance, but now we are and we're doing so well. It would be good for them to hear. We can um, we have a draft. We need to get the quarterly newsletter yeah. back up and running, but we can certainly Put that add in. that. Okay. Um, we've shared a lot of the good news on social media, yeah. um, but we can, we can continue yeah. to I'm share the good this. news. Okay. And I think it would be really beneficial for the public also to, to maybe see this presentation and watch that YouTube video mm -hmm. in, a, in, yeah. in addition to that that flyer that's sent out to really see kind of where we started, mm -hmm. you know, how this all came to fruition, um, where we're at now, and, and what we what we've done in the last really you know sixteen months. 16 they can months. see what we're doing with, it, with their tax money. This is, yes. This is good. Um, and, and you know, you know that major, major milestone. Um, if I can get this thing to something, you know, one click. So we receive the final good news um, based on our yearly rolling average, October eighth of twenty twenty. That is when um, both sites' um, its rolling average was below the. The state's threshold for TTHM. So that's that's that major day. When did we become compliant? It'll be October 8th of this past year. Um, you know, well, how'd you do it? You know, it's one thing to have a process to to really um, try to clean the water, but there is some lead time in sample results. So one of the things that we also um, found during this process, we worked with our friends in Dare County. Um, to kind of fine tune this and, 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 and find some options that a small municipal system could, could really pursue. And one of the big things that we have is we did also, um, as part of this, we got a Parker analyzer. And that is a TTHM analyzer. We've been working with that since late December um, to really see if any process changes that we make uh, affect the distribution system results. Um, these guys have really developed a knack for using this. These are tested daily um, by plant operators at various points throughout town. Um, this will really help us to, to move forward as we um, start to begin to really fine tune the flushing program for our water system. We kind of keep that fresh, clean, TTHM free, low number um, water in our system. You know, there's always unforeseen items that that come up as a result of any major project. It's just things you can't you can't plan for. But one of the you know during this process we did have a um, a uh, well failure, mechanical failure to one of our well sites at the Freemason facility. Um, and you, you know each one of these plants individually had ran independent for the entire system from sh for some short period of time. And we'll kind of touch base on that more. In the next presentation, um, but as a result of, of, of really running those wells for longer periods of time, one of the things that we found is that the, the, the water quality had changed in some regards, um, and we have seen an increase in salt use, which is used primarily during our backwash to clean that media to get things back to where they need to be as designed, um, and so. The majority of this, I'm not sure if this here, but this is just from increased use um, while one plant was, was not in operation. Um, we'll talk about some improvements we're looking at for the phase two, um, but this was one thing that had changed prior to our pilot study. Things were tested where both facilities were running at a normal operation, the wells were running at normal times, and this is just one of those things you, you really can't anticipate happening. Um, and so that's that's really the only negative that, that you know, let's say not negative, but opportunity we've had for some additional improvements that we've found from this project. Yes, sir. Uh, you said the state average was below, below 300, point 300. What about what about uh, some counties have more rest, some have more chlorine, and some have more uh, sulfur? Do they average all of that together with the water here? And so for the, for this specific project.
mandate that we're, we're targeting THMs, which is a statewide mandate um, for that blend. Um, as far as, as sulfur goes, the majority of that is removed during our aeration process at each plant. Mm -hmm. And you were asking about high iron count. Mm -hmm. Is that that's something that we don't have a problem with because of where we <coughs> get our water from the aquifer. But other counties have to deal with that. I don't know how they do, but mm -hmm. it's something that we don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. And our our aquifer is Castlepain. Yes. Okay. All right. Did you say there's some other options, maybe long term, other than salt for uh, providing the water through to uh, to get it to its uh, finished product? That seems awfully expensive and awfully uh, sort of short term. Salt is the is the main cleaning chemical, the cleaning element for yeah. the type of media. Um, in the future, um, knowing that salt costs could, could rise or could fall or could be some variability there. Um, um, knowing that this is an issue that other locations have had to address over the past five years throughout the state, throughout you know the nation, there, there may be some additional improvements in media that um, could be used once we kind of get past the shelf life of here. We could do a cost analysis to see just kind of when is the tipping point on what we spent versus actually replacing the media. But at this time, I don't, I don't know of any additional media that we could, that we could change. But specifically for what we have, we do have to use solar salt for backwash. So what, what happens to the salt? Does it, do you have to replenish the salt, or does it get mixed in with the water eventually? Where does it go? So the, the salt only um, is a part of the system during a backwash cycle. So whenever we go to basically shut down a vessel, one vessel from running. I mean, it goes into a backwash cycle, and after rinsing uh, multiple times, um, what you do is, is you, you add brine solution back. And what that does is that trickles through and that removes some of the bromide compounds, the majority of the bromide compounds from the actual media that we have. Um, that is then rinsed again, and, and, and that's a part of our discharge permit for each plant. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a waste product. Thank you. Um, can I just mention one, one thing before, before it goes into the next phase? Um, you know, from a, an operational standpoint, we have we've met all the goals and really appreciate the hard work that Corey and um, Roy and James did during construction and now you know, managing and operating the system. Um, I wrote to you in the agenda review memo that, you know, this was a $3.7 million project. Um, that's probably one of the largest capital projects the town has ever managed. And when we were closing out the project with USDA, um, we were trying real hard to make sure that we didn't leave any money on the table. And we wanted to take advantage of the, all the grant funding. Um, all the loan money was spent first, and then the grant funding. But I did want to just point out that um, at the end of the day, the, the town had to spend $1,753 to cover um, the last engineering services bill, which when you think of a $3.7 million oh, yes. project, yeah, and having, you yeah, know, that's like a 0.0004% contribution. And, you know, for a small town to manage $3.7 million, that was quite a process, too. And um, Virginia Smith did a great job, and we had, you know, good support from our partners at, at USDA. So... Um, thank you, Corey, and thank you, Virginia. Uh, and I'm glad the project is closed out. So. Thank you. Well, it says a lot for our management and our uh, staff all the way around. So, Virginia, you want to 
So now we're getting ready to spend more money. Yes. <laughs> and more, more loans and grants. And so in this next presentation, you know, when we when we started phase one and we did an initial analysis on what we needed um, currently, um, we knew that there would be some things that we would almost pick and choose and how we wanted to prioritize those. What was the initial um, problem at hand? And that was addressed in our phase one renovation and improvement at the facilities for TTHN. You know, and, and, and when we look at literally the, the structure that we had and the footprint we have, there were limits on what our facilities could consistently and safely um, and responsibly produce each day and each year. So when we talk about phase two, we're really going to look at, one, some improvements around capacity as far as um, what can we do to improve our customer supply. And also, you know, we knew that there were going to need to be some improvements around those well sites as a result of Know, prolonged use during construction. We knew there'd be some improvements there. Um, in, ad in addition to our uh, you know, needed volume, um, that was really geared more towards the safety aspect. When there's a major fire, when there's a major water line break, you know, we, we wanted to, to do what we needed to be able to safeguard our assets as well as still be able to isolate um, you know, what, is, what is needed and used in town. Um, and, and, and the plants that we have are really close to that. Um, and so um, we look between multiple options of additional trains versus ground storage tanks versus elevated storage tanks. And really, to meet that need, the best cost option that we had was to consider the construction of a half million gallon storage tank. So you say, well, what will that do? That's going to take us from roughly 800,000 gallons of tank storage to 1.3 million gallons. That does not include the additional volume that's actually stored within the pipes, um, everything from the tanks to the house. Um, and I think in the past, we have had issues previously where we found out just how quick that can go away. Um, so we wanted to try to safeguard that well, what's that silver lining for this? Well, we also want to safeguard those new plants and those wells that we're using. Um, so this project will talk about the ground storage tank as well as the rehabilitation of the existing four well sites, um, two for each plant. Um, so just to look at a uh, project timeline, um, we did receive the engineering design plans and application that was completed um, back in July of 2020. Um, you know, so we had been working this project um, while we were finishing the renovations of two plants. So we've been working very closely with Stroud and Son to do that and kind of double dipping both ways um, on both projects. Uh, we did submit the application in August of 2020. Um, we received public water supply approval back in um, September. Uh, you know, remember, it's also some of the time that we were making some improvements. Um, or, or making, continuing to make improvements for our TTHM phase one project. So there's a little bit of lag time between when we received uh, approval from public water supply and um, when we actually got the authorization to bid. Not, not much, but um, we did receive um, authorization to bid the project um, September of this past year. The pre-bid meeting was delayed a little bit. Um, we had that January of this past, well, this month, um, the 12th of this month, and um, after speaking with Lynn Wood and David about this, we are projected to receive bids February 4th. Um, we would hope to um, award the construction contract marked by the end of March, no, later than March 31st, to start work around April 15th, which is very similar to what we did before with our phase one project. And we do expect this construction to be um, a little more straightforward in a little shorter time window. We should be finished around November of this year. So let's talk about the tank. Um, you know, where's it going? 
um, what's it needed for. Um, so really what we're doing is this, this tank will be at our Beaver Hill facility. It'll be a ground storage tank similar to um, the ones that you know, Chowan County and some of the neighboring areas have. Um, this will be located at the Beaver Hill site. Um, and just you know, to kind of give you a rough idea between the tank and the four wells, we're looking at roughly 1.6 million um, in order to do this. Um, well, this, you know, what's the benefits of this tank? This tank takes us from an eight, eight to ten hour window for water loss or system pressure loss up to 24 hours. Um, and so that's, you know, that's critical for us. But it also allows us to have the ability to control how we want to run this plant. How do we want to fight that salt high cost? How do we want to balance that? When do we pick and choose to run the plant? Do we feed from the plant or do we feed from the ground storage tank? And so to give us some options and to help us really you know, cut times down for the plants, for the wells, so we should see a lot of benefit there and should see some reduction in salt use for backwash. Um, so of the four wells, uh, the Freemason facility itself, um, we did have a, an issue during construction um, where that well actually um, got a hole in the casing. So when we talk about well rehab, it will be a completely different process that we do to really rehab that well versus um, what we're going to talk about now for the other three. So that the Freemason facility, that well, will not go into the same process as, as what we talk about for the other three. But that well was also our lowest producing well, it's the one that we use the least, so we're just really going to have it there more as a backup um, to supplement anything we may need at the Freemason facility. Um, so the well uh, rehabilitation process for the additional three wells, um, this is really a four-step process, and what this is is a liquid and gas mixture of CO2 that's actually um, sent down into the well casing, into the screen, into the uh, supporting material that's around that casing. And so over time, what you get is, is you get some type of scaling or buildup of sediment and different material other than, um, <clears throat> than the water that you want. And it accumulates and you really start to see a drop in either one or two things, either water volume that you're able to pull from that well or water quality. And so the process that, that we have decided to go with for the liquid and gas is kind of the best of both worlds. That's really where, um, after um, um, consulting with Stroud and Son, where we really saw that we would get the most overall improvements. Um, and so again, this is a four-step process. Um, CO2 is, is actually um, sent down at certain areas. When that liquid and gas CO2 actually meets that water, what it does is really talk, causes some scrubbing and then really get a lot of energy as it changes from either a liquid to a gas back to a solid and vice versa. So that really aggregates, aggravates um, um, any buildup or anything that we may have around that casing, around that screen that really causes the material to really start to push out. And as it pushes out, things begin to settle. You do have some additional cleaning that, that cleans the actual casing and the screen as you've been to kind of wash that material back in so you can pull it out. Um, and then after that, what you should see is improved water quality from those raw wells, as well as a, the additional volume that you may need if you had to run at that speed. Um, so this is, you know, long and short, this is really kind of like cleaning a filter. Um, this is a chemical injection way of, of cleaning that well with um, something that's, that's inert as far as um, water quality safety to our um, citizens. You know, we, we still talk long term. There are some additional items you know, that, that, that we would like to move through phase one and phase two that we talk about potential for um, you know, additional well sites um, beyond what we have now as we continue to see increase consumption within the town, whether that be residential or commercial use. Um, you know, and, and really that, that's kind of a long-term goal for us, but it is something to really kind of keep in the back of the mind in the mind um, as we move forward because it's, you know, things wear out, things get old, you know, things kind of 
sometimes need to be freshened up, which is you know kind of where we're going to, with phase two. And sometimes you know you have to do that. And um, anyways, that's it. You say you have four possible bidders on the contract, is that it? Five are interested. Five attended the um, pre-bid meeting, so hopefully we'll get five bids. That would be fantastic. Are there people we've worked with in the past? Or? One of the contractors is. Mm -hmm. Or unless we're going to have to bid again. Was the one that did the water treatment plan upgrades for us. Okay. So fingers and toes crossed for good bids on February 4th. That's when we're going to open bids. Okay. We have time right here. Yes. Yeah. I hope Central is not bidding on it. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Central, they're, they're sewer. They don't do um, this type of water work. Yeah. I think, you know, Roger was asking about the I&I &I contractor, but they do mainly sewer and stormwater. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Before we go into Father Kirk, uh, Corey, I would like to commend you and send that kudos to you for learning all this stuff as quickly as you did. And uh, I think your mechanical and your engineering abilities has saved us quite a bit of money. And we just want you to know we, we're very thankful for that. Okay, our next committee meeting is our administrative committee, and that's uh, chaired by uh, Councilman Hyde. Thank you, Mayor Stallings. Uh, the administrative committee has uh, six items for your information and or action tonight. Uh, the first matter is a grant agreement, and this is just for informational purposes for the pavement and lighting uh, rehabilitation project. Um, out of the airport on runway 1-19. Uh, uh, the good news, um, several bits of good news as it relates to this item. Uh, one uh, is subject to a grant and the state has now approved that uh, grant and the grant does not require any uh, matching local funds at all. Um, we don't need to uh, take I any action on this tonight. We are going to have uh, our aviation uh, experts and uh, consultants, Jay Talbert and Stephen Bright, that are going to meet with us via Zoom at our February 9th uh, regular meeting. They'll be able to give us some more information on that. The second item is for information purposes um, also, and we'll need to take a vote on this at the February meeting, but uh, we need to enter into an agreement uh, for professional services with Talbert and Bright uh, to carry out this project um, and to give them authorization to move forward. The state uh, kind of as a safeguard uh, requires that we have a third party review the um, estimates for the design and engineering cost and that third party has reviewed the Talbert and Bright uh, contract and its fees and found it to uh, be a reasonable fee. So those two items, we would just ask that, that we uh, place those on the agenda for February 9th and that we uh, uh, listen to the presentation at that time and then vote on it. Uh, the uh, third uh, matter that we need to consider is uh, an offer that we have received to purchase some town property. The town property is approximately 18 acres out by the airport. It's adjacent to the airport. We've never used it. Uh, that. Uh, anybody can can remember and the airport's not used it, it is a part of an old uh, landfill that um, abuts Kerry Parish's uh, property and he has come to us inquiring about whether we would uh, be interested uh, in selling this I know that Anne Marie feels like because of the type of use that it was put to previously a landfill and the fact that we've not put any use to it nor has the airport put any use to it um, that we would certainly be happy to consider that. Um, the, the legal process would be very, very similar to what we do with the houses where we have the upset bid process. And um, Anne-Marie, if we 
entered into a resolution like we do with the, the houses, um, does that need to be done at the February 9th meeting and not this meeting? So no real action um, that needs to be taken by the committee or the council uh, tonight. And that's just for informational purposes uh, to know that it's out there. And I believe Anne Marie's going to get together with um, our town attorney and start working on some things um, to put that in order to get that process uh, rolling. But as you recall, we, we, I don't know if there'll be as much interest in this property, anyone other than Mr. Parrish, but with those other houses, we started out and kind of got some momentum and got some higher bids, but that would be the same process. And if there were no upset bidders, then we would sell it at the uh, bid upon price. The uh, next uh, item is uh, information on just an update on the Human Relations Commission. The commission held its first um, official meeting last week. Um, Councilman Bond is our um, council liaison between this council and that committee, uh, and he uh, is attending those meetings. And probably the best thing, um, Councilman Bond, is to hand it over to you and just give us a brief overview about how that went, if you would. Okay, be glad to. We met last Wednesday at 5.30. Uh, a pretty lengthy meeting. It was the first time that this group had gotten together to see each other one-on-one. -on -one. And they did an introduction, told a little bit about themselves, their education, why they wanted to be on the committee. And it was very good. You, you walked away from, from this meeting feeling that we chose a good group of people. They're eager to work and they want to work on any problems that we feel that the town has that this committee can help them with. And I'm, I'm happy about it. I really am. My boss lady was there. <laughs> it, it, it was very, um, it was a great first meeting, um, they agreed to meet, they want to meet on an accelerated schedule for the first couple months. Instead of meeting just once a month, they want to meet twice a month uh, for the first few months to get really into their work. Um, and they were given some homework. They some were homework. asked to identify three, um, three projects, projects or three that issues that they, they want to work on. Right. And so there's they are submitting those um, to us, and then we'll um, submit them all to the group, and they're meeting again in early February, mm -hmm. and then we'll review that list. And uh, Dr. Betts and Barbara went over the list of stuff that all of us done at those two meetings that we went to, and it was a, it was a very good meeting. Uh, everybody left with smiles, and they said they were eager to go to work. And if I would, too, I wanted to say that at the end of the meeting, they were asked to um, give feedback about what they appreciated mm -hmm. and do they have any concerns. And more than several said how much they appreciated the mayor and council for having the courage to follow through with establishing this commission. They said it could have been easy to say, yes, we want to do it, but we'll do it later. And I think that you, I, I wanted you all to know that that was said, councilman, by at least two or three of the members. True. Yeah. True. Thank you, Councilman Bond. The uh, next item is an update on our boards and commission. Uh, this um, has has been one of the many things that kind of been put on the back burner due to COVID. But you recall back in March of last year, uh, right before we got hit by the tidal wave called COVID, um, we had asked staff to advertise for vacancies on the boards and commissions that the town has. And um, we have received um, four or five uh, applications for the various uh, committees. And the time has come to start moving forward. Uh, we were almost a year delayed on that. Um, Anne Marie felt it would be a good idea, and I concur, uh, to see if we could get any more um, interested applicants, just to see if we could get a, uh, a, a greater pool of ap applicants. And one thing that she's going to do is to reach out to the townspeople who uh, applied for the Human Relations Committee, 
but did not get on that and see if any of them have any interest on serving on any of these um, committees. The uh, action item that we can do is, as Amory reaches out to those people and we feel like we've got a good working group of applicants as administrative committee can start setting up uh, interviews um, of those interested persons and then bring those names back to council so that we can officially appoint those people to those well, commissions. I think that's a great pool to, to draw from. Yeah. Do, do, we, do we need to re-advertise or maybe just put something on Facebook? We, we did. Um, you all asked us right after yeah. Thanksgiving. Okay, so we've already done we, that. We did okay. advertise, but we'll do it again. I mean, it's on our website. On our website. Okay. But we can push it out on social media. But we did advertise in the newspaper. Yeah, I think pushing it out on social media. Yeah, I think that'd be great. So, are we changing the interviewing process? Can I say something about that? Yeah, sir. Uh, I'd like the council to consider uh, changing the interviewing process from the council to the administrative committee. Let us, the administrative committee, uh, interview these people and then report back to you our decision as a recommendation for the council. Be less uh, time for council to be here. It's also less intimidating for the interviewee sitting in front of us all uh, at one time. Uh, what do you all think of that? We would advertise, you know, chair, uh, councilman Highwood, you know, we would advertise when, when we're going to do this and where we're going to do this in case you want to come and be part of the I will see if it ain't broke, don't fix it, don't try to fix it. This has been a portion of the council way before I got up here, and I'm, you know, I, I was the youngest thing up here at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I still feel like the youngest one. But this is the way that the council got a chance to meet the applications, meet the applicants, talk to them and ask them questions, and go from there to come up with a decision. Instead of just committee. Well, one, one thing I think is important is the person that is the liaison to that committee be there for, for that, those particular, you know, interviews. And I mean, I can work my schedule around, but it's really hard for me to, to try to figure out another time to meet. I mean, I know, you know, they're hacking our basically in court all the time. And so it's really hard for us to figure out another time other than, you know, than this. But I mean, I, I, would, I would personally like to be, especially be present on those for those committees that I'm sort of in charge of. Okay, this is Josh. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, okay. Councilman Miller. <laughs> Next. I, <laughs> I like new <laughs> ideas, though. <laughs> the next uh, item is for informational purposes only, and this is a, a very um, exciting agenda item uh, for me and particularly uh, very exciting for Councilman Coleman but uh, Elizabeth Bryant and Councilman Coleman and we can certainly give them thanks for this worked on a grant application for the North Carolina Department of Transportation planning grant and that grant is centered on reviewing the town's existing plans as it relates to pedestrian sidewalk plans a regional bicycle plan greenways and open space master plan and uh, we have heard back from the Department of Transportation that that grant has been approved. It's a $35,000 uh, grant and we are required to um, put up a 10% match, which would be $3,500. Um, this certainly fits in with a lot of the goals that we have set um, and a lot of the ideals we'd like to see the town pursue as it relates to a walkable town, a town that has a number of uh, green spaces and just as a more active, inviting town for people. Um, like I said, this is just for informational purposes. Um, the state has sent a draft grant, uh, grant agreement to us. We don't have a final agreement, but we expect that sometime this week or early next week. Uh, it should be in a position for us to take a look at it and vote on it um, at our February 9th council meeting. Um, Anne Marie, as a part of that, is gonna ask uh, Virginia Smith to um, prepare a small capital budget ordinance for that portion that we're responsible for. Again, that's $3,500. And hopefully it'll be a position for us to vote on on February 9th 
Uh, but that's uh, very, very exciting. And um, I know Councilman Coleman, I can't wait to see what uh, their recommendations are to our existing plans uh, on those type of things. I'd like so, to say just a couple of things that might yes. follow up. That's all right. uh, we were the only ones in the state to get an accelerated plan grant. Uh, we got the maximum amount. Uh, there's 15 grants awarded. But the uh, uniqueness of this grant is it's not only on planning, it's on implementation. So in defining some uh, specific projects that we can undertake and to get those going. So it's a, it's a little bit more practical than these long, thick books you'll see on a on bicycle pedestrian plan. Hopefully uh, half of it will be on specific projects that will improve uh, bicycle and pedestrian traffic in, uh, in Eden. And as you know, this has been a tough year for us. We've had a couple of tragic accidents uh, with residents involved in bicycling. And so I think the time is right for people to gather to, to increase and uh, to decrease the motorization of, of the town and increase walkability in bicycling. So that's a uh, point. And, and one thing, and Roger's comments just uh, brought this to mind. I'm very, very interested in them looking at our sidewalk plan. When I ride through town, it appears that some of our neighborhoods are unserved, underserved by, by sidewalks, and I do. I uh, want this to be a very walkable town, and some of those neighborhoods where we're underserved with sidewalks are in neighborhoods where people might not have as reliable transportation as other neighborhoods, and I think it's important that uh, we recognize that, that we do have some spots in town that we need to um, up our game in terms of providing our citizens sidewalks. Are these some areas in the redevelopment zones, are they in the, some of these areas within, within the redevelopment zones? They're, I'm just all speaking all generally all, all across town. So, but uh, Mayor Stallings, that uh, was an enjoyable report and a lot of good, good things to report on, but that concludes our report. And I think Councilman Poole, do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I'm thinking about sidewalk. Uh, on 32, which is uh, uh, Virginia Road, from the stoplight, right on up there, where all the way, there's no, there's no sidewalk. And I saw a lady with a bag of, 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 of walking in the road. That's kind of dangerous because cars go in both lanes on both sides, going fast, and they had, they had to get over in the other lane to pass. Uh, somebody ought to look at that and see how much it, how much it costs to put a sidewalk on on the side where all the businesses do. I agree, and that and it's interesting yeah. you mentioned that particular stretch because that's one of the stretches I was I, talking I totally about. Agree with you. Um, yeah. it, it's important for our citizens who don't have reliable transportation to be able to walk there to the grocery store and those other businesses yeah. that are there and to be able to do so safely. So I hope that's one of the things that we can look at. But that's that's one of the parts of town I was talking about. And I think it's also important for people that do have reliable transportation to walk. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And when you say 32, you're talking about going out towards uh, for the shop center. How do you? Yeah. There's sidewalks there there sidewalk. out there. There's sidewalks but out there. But on Luke Street, there's none. Wait, wait. On oh, where? Luke? Like on Luke Street, Luke if, you, if, you, if you're trying to avoid the traffic and scared right. of traffic as you come behind the hospital, and then we cut right to go up by the Methodist Church and by Speedway. There's, there's a lot of communities where there's no sidewalks. Right. That's what you yeah, say. that's what I'm saying. I'd yeah. like for us to look at it. Look at that. So we're going to look at all communities? That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Some of them okay. are, are very underserved, okay. if not non existent. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. What the same thing. I'm talking about the same thing. Sidewalks and trees. Yeah. You know, yeah, both of you. Both of Love to see us. And Councilman Bob, you and I can talk about it later, but I have a suspicion we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, I'm right off okay. along with there with yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Councilman Howe, for your comments and all. And the next committee is a uh, finance committee, and that's chaired by Councilman Dixon. And I guess I have one small thing. We're getting, we're fixing the, I looked it up, architecture. I think it's a faux architecture. Um, and so, photo architrave, architrave, and um, it, it's which used to be the plant above columns, and they back in the 1890s they just started making them into weird little concave boxes. But somebody put something that 
the cement board or something up there, and then the stuff that is cracked. So you're taking six thousand dollars out of the sales tax revenue and spending it on town hall. So that's at least we'll send that to full committee. And I think if you look at town hall, it needs it. It needs it. So yeah. That's, that's and what part of it? Just as we're walking by, I, I know you showed a picture in our packet, but. If you're standing in front, um, it's up above the first floor windows. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think there's still some cones. There's some cones out there now. Kind of blocking. Just, just, just look up from those cones. Yeah, it's, okay. it's on. The, it's on the new addition side. Okay. Because I mean the original building was There's also a place down by the sidewalk as well, in the very front of the job. They're going to fix that as well. Mm -hmm. When was that structure built? It was a bank. Nineteen bank. Eighteen yeah. something like that, wasn't it? That did. Maybe it was earlier. Was it? Was it? E Edenton Banking Company. That was Edenton Banking Company. Yeah, was, yeah. I was yeah. trying to figure out yeah. where yeah. was yeah. that bank in. Edenton Bank. Okay. Edenton Bank. Bank of Edenton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the story, I, I'll tell you a quick story. The story I've always heard is that when they had a run on the bank, that um, Miss Gr Miss, old Miss Graham and Rose, Grandmama, and, and my great grandfather, a bunch of people, they, got, they went to Charlotte and got all the dollar bills they could get from the mint in Charlotte. Brought them back one dollar bills, and Miss Graham had a bunch of hundred. She's the only person in town that hundred dollar bill, and she put them on top of the stacks. Did you? And so when the people came up to um, to get their money out of the bank, all these people were sitting behind it. And they thought they were stacks of hundred dollar bills. <laughs> that same well, way. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know whether that's oral history or not, but that's what I've always heard. <laughs> all right, that completes our agenda. So if no one else has anything, we'll consider ourselves adjourned. Thank you, sir. Thank you.